great to be with you. It's a, it's a good week to be here. I think it's a fitting week, actually. So if you haven't been here before, we are going through a sermon series called The Good Fight. And uh, the point of the series is there's a lot more going on than you probably understand, spiritual-wise. Like, there's not just a physical world. There's, there's a spiritual world. And so I've been breaking that down. And then I said, listen, if you are in a spiritual battle, hopefully you have spiritual weapons. And Paul lets us know about this spiritual weaponry that we have in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And he begins to break it down piece by piece. And so for the last five weeks, we've been opening up God's word and digging through each part of that, of that armor that he says. And I want to kind of, you know, refresh your memory of where we've been. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Truth is the very essence of who we are as, as people. We need the truth of God. The Bible says the truth will set us free. Then it goes on to say, and the breastplate of righteousness in place. You're going to protect your heart with God's righteousness and your feet fitted with the gospel shoes of peace. So we talked about what peace does, the peace that surpasses all understanding. L- last week, we opened up uh, the, the, the topic of the shield of faith. He says, in addition, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. So here was the point of last week's message. Satan knows where you're going with God, and he wants to do everything he can to keep you from it. So he's going to distract you. He's going to throw situations into your life to take you off course. We have two more weeks, and I think today is fitting. Uh, week number, number six in our message series, verse number 17, says lastly, to take up the helmet of salvation. We're going to talk about the sword of the Spirit next week. But this is actually the very last piece of armor that you put on. The armor or the sword is not something you put on. The sword is something you use. The very last thing you put on, the most crucial part of, of, of the armor of God, what does he say? Put on the helmet of salvation. And I think this is so so interesting. And I, I started thinking about helmets that I've worn, uh, helmets that I've liked, helmets that I have not liked. I, I hate bike helmets. I just, I don't, I've never seen a cool looking bike helmet. Anybody else? Doesn't, doesn't exist. I remember when they made it a law when I was a kid. You, somebody, you know, I don't know what happened, 12 years old, you got to wear a bike helmet. And so I'm on my BMX bike with a dorky helmet from, you know, Brad or James Way in Pottsdown. Looks like a mushroom on my top of my head. And I hated that thing. I hated wearing that type of helmet. But I can tell you one type of helmet that I've always dreamed about wearing that I never actually had the opportunity to because I didn't play the sport, a football helmet. Do we have any football players in this room? You guys, listen, I was a soccer player. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But I always wanted to be a football player. In fact, this year my kids played football after some convincing from to my wife, football is good sport. They're not going to die. They're not going to, you know, get a concussion. They're going to be fine, all these things. She let them play. And I'll have you know, by the middle of the season, she was a bigger football fan than I was. And so I loved football. I got so into football that I imagined myself playing football. And from time to time, I would sneak into my son's room, take their helmet when they weren't, when they weren't home, put the helmet on, and get in the mirror and pretend that I was a football player. There's something about putting on the helmet. Anybody ever put on it? You just immediately feel tough. You feel like you have big muscles. You see yourself running out of the tunnel somewhere with music playing and and smoke going and 75,000 crazy, rabid, grumpy Philadelphia fans, we're not sure, depending on what day it is, running out of the tunnel. You just feel something when you put that helmet on. I might have done it more than one time. I'll probably do it again when they start football season again. Like, I love putting on the football helmet. It does something to me. It makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel like I'm indestructible. It makes me feel like I could kill everything in my path. Anybody else remember what it feels like? I love the thought of putting on the helmet of salvation. There's something significant to what he's saying. In fact, if you read scripture uh, and you understand this helmet, the helmet's called the Galea. That's what it's called in, in Rome. It was the last piece of armor you put on. It literally was what you put on before you went to battle. And the, the implications were this thing makes me invincible. It's going to cover up my head. It's going to come down over my nose. You've seen the movies. You looked awesome in this helmet. You were ready to go to battle. But the spiritual implications are even cooler than that. In the Bible, Uh, The head, which the helmet would protect, was the central, most important aspect of a person. In in fact, uh, oftentimes in Scripture, you go to the Old Testament, they would anoint people. Like a prophet would come and anoint uh, a a person to be used by God. And when they anointed a person to be used by God, they didn't slap them on the back and say, Hey, buddy, Bob, you're going to be used by God. They would anoint their head and they would place their hands on top of their head to pray. The the, the, the practical implication was, you're going to leave 
and you are anointed by God, but other people are going to come against you and tell you you're not, I want you to remember in your mind what you've been anointed for. There's other instances in the Bible when they would put a curse on somebody, guess what they would touch? Their head. There's something to your head. There's something going on with your mind, and Satan knows if he can control your head, he can control your life. So today I want to talk about this, and here's why I love this, because I think this is so applicable to the females in this room. Now, I'm not a female, but I've been married to one for 20 years, so I kind of have an understanding of how they act. Any other husbands know what I'm talking about. We don't talk about it enough unless we're alone, but we know how our wives act. We know what they mean. We know what they're thinking. We know, we, we know it. Like, my wife is a deep thinker. She wants to dissect every conversation. She wants to know, how did you say it? Where were they at? What did they look like? What tone did you use? Anybody else? Rehearse and re, you know, re, re, recite the entire conversation back to me. And I'll, sometimes I have a conversation, and she'll be like, what did you say? And I'll be like, well, they said yes. And what did you say? I said yes, too. We were good. We were talking, what did what, what, what they say? how they act? what they look like? Did you make any physical contact? How was their body language? Everything is mental. Sometimes I'll talk to her and I can tell she's having a bad day, but she's not having a bad day because it's 20 degrees in May. I'm having a bad day because of that. She's having a bad day because mentally she's struggling with something. She's going through something. She's carrying something. She's thinking about, anybody else know I'm talking about females? She's thinking about something. She's going over a conversation. She's thinking about something that happened in 1988 in Tecumseh, Oklahoma. She remembered something that they said. She's going over things. She's struggling with her emotions. She's carrying something from a, something she said or a mistake that she made. Like, I can make a mistake. I just go to bed. The Bible says God's mercies are new every morning. Let's just get to the morning. I'll be cool, right? She wants to talk about it. And I, and I just love that we're going to talk about the mind because I think, I know we all struggle with our thought life, but I think for some of you, especially moms, this is the greatest battle you have. You struggle mentally with your thought life. You struggle with your mind. You allow Satan to overwhelm and inflict wounds and confuse you and do all sorts of destruction in your head. And I love that he says, don't forget to put on the helmet of salvation. He's just conveying what scripture says. Watch what it says in Romans 8. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. First Peter says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, I love this. This is a reoccurring theme in scripture. You're going to see another verse in a second. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. I love that he says to be alert and of sober mind. Here's why. Because oftentimes when you're not sober, you have introduced an outside substance to overwhelm who you are as a person. So what does scripture say? Don't allow those things to come into your mind to influence you. Be of sober mind. Before some of you are saved, you understand the implications of this because you will go out as an ugly dude and you would drink a little bit of substance and all of a sudden you would be handsome. But we know based on scientific fact that you are still ugly. He says, well, some of you allow the thoughts of the world to, 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 to confuse you, to drunken you, to overwhelm you. He says, be of sober mind. Protect your mind. In, in, in fact, uh, one of the greatest uh, voices on the power of the mind is also a Christian. Her name's Dr. Caroline Leaf. You can go, go research her and study her. She's phenomenal in her research and what she's, what she's taught. But she says this. She says, we tend to think of thoughts as intangible and theoretical. But after much research, it has been proven that the thoughts that we have affect our physical brains and our bodies. In other words, she says, if you could understand how powerful that your thought life is, you would never have a negative thought again. They've proven it. You ever do this when you get into a situation, something's happened in your life, and uh, you've moved on from it, but years later or months later or days later, you'll be talking with somebody and you begin to speak about it happening again, and you're assuming it's not a big deal because it happened three years ago and you're speaking about it happening again. Research has proven that your brain cannot decipher does not understand that you're not actually going through it again because the power of your thoughts and your words. It's actually going to affect your body the exact same way it affected your body the first time it happened. And Satan knows this. And so what does Paul say? He says, make sure you put on the helmet of salvation. Protect your, your thought life. Protect your mind. Protect what you think. Scripture says this in Romans 12. It says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Science calls this neuroplasticity. 
And the, the, this is the, the ability for the mind to, to readjust, to, to create new, new, new neurons, they say, new, new memories, new emotions based on your thought life. That the power of, of the mind, you can study it. The Bible says that, that, that renew your mind. When, when you're going through stuff, renew your mind. I started thinking about this. I, I renovated my house this last year, my lower floor of my house. I moved into a house that was built in the 60s. Anybody ever move into an old house and everybody tells you the house has character? That's what people say when the house is old, right? And it had, it had character. It also had smells to it. It was 1960s. The house is 60, 70 years old, whatever it is. And it was a great house. It had great bones, right? That's what old men say to you. It has great bones. And they don't make houses like this and anymore. And see those new houses? They put them together so quick. Yeah, because they have power tools now. And so I'm just... <laughs> That's like saying, see those people, they get to get a brush so fast because we drive in cars, not buggies, right? Like, <laughs> can't be good. They get there too fast. And so, like, it, so you get this house, and I remember I moved into this house, and we painted, and we did all these things, but it still had that smell. I don't know if it was, like, the human skin. I don't know what it was, but it just smelled. The floor is oak, you know, thin oak wood floor. It just had a, a smell. There was no subfloor in the floor. And so no matter what we would do, the basement would just kind of come smell through the, the floor. And no matter how many times we painted the walls, it just had, had a smell. It just, just was an older house. And then this year, we started renovating the house. And we started tearing the old out and putting the new in. I, remember houses that were so old, they didn't put light fixtures in the houses? What? I mean, 1800s? I mean, what is this? Thomas Edison called. And so, so I, remember, I walked in, I'm like, we got to put lights. So we put lights in, and we took the, the ceiling out, which means we put new drywall up, and then we re-drywalled a lot of the, the walls that were left, and we tore down a lot of the walls, and we tore down walls. We tore out mouse mice nests, and we tore out that old, that old wire that's like this big that cannot be safe in your wall. We tore wire out, and we put a new floor down, and all, all of a sudden, the more new we put in, the more the old went away. All of a sudden, my house, when you walk into the bottom floor, top floor still has the old house smell, by the way. But the bottom floor feels like a new house, even though it's 60 or 70 years old, because we put so much new into it. And that's what the Bible is saying. It's not that you've never been through anything. It's not that you've never experienced anything. But through Christ and Scripture and truth, you can renew the mind. It's not a one-time thing. It's an every day. Reading it, thinking it, meditating on it, repeating it, reading it, meditating on it, thinking it, repeating it this is what renewing your mind based on research is and the power the problem is many of us we have a hard time trying to renew our mind because we can't keep up with the thought life that we need to take captive that, that's why scripture says in second corinthians chapter number number 12 paul says it or chapter 10 he says the weapons we fight are not weapons of this world on the contrary they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What's a stronghold? A stronghold is a way of thinking that you can't get, up, get away from. A stronghold is a generational curse. A, a, a stronghold is something that's been passed down to you. A stronghold is, is the way that you comprehend and see things. You know, a stronghold is something that keeps you back from being who God wants you to be. Watch what he says. He says this next. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought, and we make it obedient to Christ. And so I'm going to give you a few voices that you need to take captive, and then you're going to renew your mind with God's truth. Here's three voices. These are the voices that I've struggled with in my life. And the first one's obvious because we've been talking about him, the voice of Satan. The first voice you need to start taking captive is the voice of Satan. He knows if he can control your thoughts, he can control your entire life. And so he is going to constantly come at you and try to overwhelm you. In fact, Peter tells us again, watch what he says, be alert and of what? Of sober mind. Don't allow him to introduce his garbage to mess up your mind. Be of sober mind for your de the enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. So here's just a couple of things I've seen in my life that, that how Satan has overwhelmed me with in my thought life. First one is distractions, which we've talked about last week, and so I'm going to give you a really practical way that he's going to do it in my life that maybe you've seen in your life. How many of you know vacation is coming up? Anybody get, get ready to go on vacation? Can I just get a, a clap as loud as you can for vacation? Like I... If you're not excited about vacation after this spring, you're dead inside. <laughs> I can, I, I have my wife, I got up today, we were driving down here, it was freezing cold, I had a t-shirt on, I said, I'm not putting on a long sleeve shirt, it's a principal thing. 
I'm not letting Satan win today. I'm wearing a t-shirt. I don't care how cold it is. And so we got in the car. We're driving. It had rained the last two days. I told you about my grass. I didn't mow it on Thursday. I didn't know it was going to rain. And so it's been a thing all week with me. I've been watching it grow. It's laughing at me. It's been a thing. I woke up today. It's still, it's still raining. And so we were driving here. And out on the way, oh, I said, pull out your calendar. I said, tell me how many weeks. Confirm with me how many weeks we have till vacation. Because I don't think I can do this anymore. And she said, we have, we have six weeks. I said, no, that's too long. I said, look one more time. She said, we have five weeks. I pulled the car over. I turned the revival music on. I started. And, and I was like, we got five weeks. I was like, I can't wait. So five weeks from now, we're not going to go on vacation. I'm not even going to be thinking about nobody, nothing. I'm going to get on vacation. We're going to drive down to South Carolina. We're going to spend two weeks down at South Carolina. I love vacation. Anybody else? Vacation's awesome. Vacation is a great excuse to spend as much money as you want to spend. It doesn't matter. You're on vacation. You ever do that? How much money we have? We're on vacation. We'll worry about it when we get home, right? You ever do that? Can we get ice cream? vacation. Can we go, okay, one minute to go off every night, we're going on vacation. I won't think about anything. In fact, every, every year on vacation, at some point, I get, out, I get out my real estate app on my phone, and I look at real estate at the place that I'm at, and I think to myself, I wonder if I had to go home. <laughs> I wonder if taxes here. What school's like? My kids don't need school. Like 14. Like, you'll be fine. <laughs> Anybody else do that? I don't want to go home. And I love vacation because it's not real. You just get to enjoy it. You deal with it when you get home. But I know every year before I go on vacation, something bad's going to happen. Something's going to break. Something's going to blow up. Somebody's going to be mad. Somebody's going to leave the church. Every year, somebody leaves the church right before vacation. I always want to send them an email. I'm on vacation. I don't care, right? But I do, and I know how he works. He wants me to think about it. He wants to overwhelm me. He wants me to focus on it. He wants me to worry about my car, worry about this, and worry about that, and worry about my, you know, my, 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 my AC blowing up on my house. I remember one year a tree fell on my house on vacation. Like all these things. This is how he likes to work. He wants to hold you captive through distractions, ruining what God is doing in your life. We talked about this last week, but let me just give you a few other thoughts. He likes to overwhelm you with confusion. He likes to point at things and go, this isn't how it's supposed to work. And if God was for you, this wouldn't happen. And if God was working in your favor, he wouldn't allow this. Let me just speak on one more that I think is so fitting, especially for females. He loves to hold you captive with condemnation. One, one, one person said, Satan knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. He knows who you are. He knows you're saved. He knows you're sanctified. He knows you're filled with the Holy Ghost. He knows you're a child of God adopted into his family. He knows your destination is heaven. He, he knows God is for you, not against you, but he is still, if you're not careful in renewing your mind, he is still going to come at you with, with words of condemnation. Maybe you're a mom and you can understand this. You're not good enough. Your Pinterest board doesn't match up. Your house doesn't look right. You're not a good enough mom. You don't get to all their events. You're not in the PTO. Your kids don't you didn't get enough pictures. You didn't take any pictures of the first t-ball game. It's probably because it was the boringest thing in the world. And it's freezing outside. They're going to hate me when they get older. I didn't give them enough memories. I didn't take care of them enough. I, they got, woke me up in the middle of the night for the seventh time this week, and it's only Monday. And I was grumpier than I should have been, and I didn't cook them breakfast enough. Johnny's mom cooks them breakfast every day. I gave them Pop-Tarts. <laughs> and I have to work full time because of this, and I can't do this for them. And I can't. And condemnation, you're not a good mom. They're going to turn out weird. They're going to be broken. They're not going to be as good as this one. You shouldn't be making them do their own wash. They're 16. They should have been doing their wash four years ago, but this is another sermon. You shouldn't be making them. You expect too much. And all this condemnation. I'm just talking to the ladies. I can tell you about them. The, it does the same thing to the men, but we, we're, we ignore it a lot of times. <laughs> he just works us over. And the voice of Satan is just on the attack in our lives. Let me give you another voice that I've, that I've experienced in my own life that I struggle with. I call it the voice of society. You know what I'm talking about? Loved ones. People from your past, siblings, parents, aunts and uncles, grandparents, bosses, teacher. Remember a couple weeks ago, I jokingly said something about how you weren't picked for the fifth grade dodgeball team? And some of you laughed, but it wasn't really a joke. Because you know you don't forget that. 
I can tell you the times people said something to me. I can remember like it was yesterday when I was in fifth grade. Uh, a guy, I can tell you his name first and last. Remember his face because I hated it to my counseling session last year. And uh, he yelled down the things and he said, your jeans are holy. I told you this story before. And it was before, you know, it was cool to have holy jeans. I just had holy jeans because I was the son of a pastor. We didn't have any money. He said, your jeans are holy. You're a loser. I remember, I remember that. I remember when I got cut in seventh grade baseball from, from, from the Bear Cubs in Boyertown. I should have made it. I was making everything, and I got cut, and I had to play Babe Ruth baseball. I remember the name of the coach. I remember what he looked like. I remember the names of the kids that made the team instead of me. For years, I've held it. That was politics, Boyertown politics, liberals, right? And, so, and it just, the voice of society. Satan loves to overwhelm you with his lies, and then he also loves when you begin to listen to lies and words and confusion and condemnation and all the words from people in your past that are speaking things over you. And here's what I'm saying. It, there is never not going to be a time in your life when you don't need the words of other people to confirm things or for wisdom. But there's also times in your life when you need to turn down the voice of people in your life. You need to consider the source. Do I want to turn out like them? Absolutely not. Are they miserable? Probably. Right? Are they a couch critic? You know what that is? They don't, they're not doing anything significant in their life, so they have time to criticize what you're doing because if they were doing anything significant, they would be too out of breath to be spewing that at you. And I'm just telling you, from time to time, you got to take captive the thoughts of those around you. In fact, one of my favorite stories happens in the Bible to a man named Elisha. So I know it happens to you because it happened to him, and he was a great man of God. He gets anointed to be the next prophet after a man named Elijah. I know, kind of confusing. I'm going to take it up with God someday. We could have had different names like Bob and Jim, right? And so, but it's Elijah and Elisha. Elijah comes, anoints Elisha, and then Elisha follows him for many years. Eventually, Elijah gets taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire, the Bible says, and Elisha is left to be the new prophet. And soon after that, some young boys come to him and they say, hey, Baldy, hey, Baldy, which we're going, okay, no big deal, right? Like, but at that time, to not have hair, many people thought God was against you like oh he's not he's not for you you don't have any hair sorry guys some of you and so he's not for you right he doesn't he's not and so when they say that they're actually attacking his character and his value with God and this is going to happen in your life if you're not careful you need to take captive the thoughts of society and let me just give you one more the third one uh, you need to take captive thought the thoughts of yourself some of you ain't going to admit it because it's embarrassing but you talk to yourself way too much You, you, you struggle with your, own, with your own condemnation. You beat yourself up. You talk about all of your mistakes. You think about all the things you've done, you've done wrong. You carry the weight of your mistakes. You carry the baggage of your regret. You think to yourself, I should have done better. I should have been a better this, or I should have been better at this. And you carry the weight of, of your mistakes and I'm just telling you another voice to take captive is the voice of self in fact we we know that we all struggle with it and you can see examples of this in scripture but my favorite one is remember the story where Jesus feeds 5,000 people with the boys lunch you guys ever read that that story and uh the boy says or the story says when he does this he's in the home of one of his disciples named Philip the hometown so uh, it's always harder it's always harder to accept uh, the miraculous and expect the miraculous when you're near home. I don't know if you notice that or not. So like, it's just like, it, I've seen it to be true in my own life. Like if I go preach this message and somebody's church doesn't know me, they're going to be like, that was phenomenal. But I could preach it here. It's like, eh, could have done better. It's Mother's Day, really? Couldn't have gave me Proverbs 31 today, right? Something like that. And, uh, but it's always harder. It's harder for me. Like it's, if I'm here and I'm worshiping, right? And I'm trying to pay attention. This is my home. I'm looking at all around. That light's not right. This person's not, you know, not supposed to be there. That camera shot's blurry. That's, and it's, but if I go to somebody else's church, I'm like, it's not my problem. Jesus, right? <laughs> okay, what's blowing up? <laughs> and this is, this is, this is, this is what happens in life. Like you, you can, 
you always, it's hard to, to ex experience the, the miraculous when it's close to home. So Philip is in a hometown, and it, it's lunchtime, and Jesus has preached too long. Nobody would tell him because he's Jesus. Everybody gets hungry, the Bible says, and they start to murmur. They want food. Jesus already knows what he's going to do. He knows there's a boy in the crowd. He's going to take his lunch. He's going to multiply it. He's going to feed 5,000 people. There's going to be 12 baskets left over, one for each disciple. It's a, it's a crazy story. But the first thing he does, he asks Philip, because he knows it's going to be hard for Philip. He says, Philip, where can we get some food? Philip goes, it's Sunday, Chick-fil-A is closed. We don't have enough money. I've, I've been off work because I've been following you. He says this. He says, even if I worked the entire year, we all worked the entire year, we wouldn't be able to earn enough to buy enough bread to give everybody just one bite. In other words, we're in trouble. And you see it. Like, it's, it's Philip's hometown. So what is he being? He's being logical. He's being mathematical. He's, you, you know, calculated. This isn't going to work. And this is what happens in our life. It's always, it's always hardest. It's easy for me. Listen, it's easy for me to see the goodness and the grace and the miraculous that God wants to do in other people's lives. I'll talk to them. I'll be like, yeah, your marriage is, is broke, but, you know, God can fix that. Yeah, your kids are messed up. God can heal that. You need a job. God can open up a door. But you ever, you ever it's easier to tell somebody else that, but then you get in a situation where you're like, God's not going to do that for me. I, I, I know mathematically it's not going to work. And uh, calculations say this. And I just want to remind you of a few things. Listen, God didn't call you because you're logic, the logical choice. He didn't pick you because you're the most qualified. He, he didn't call you because you have the most spectacular background. And he didn't choose you because you have the highest score on the test. God calls you because he's that good. In fact, one of my favorite scriptures that I'll say to myself oftentimes, it's the belt of truth. As I remind myself, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I remind myself of that a lot because I feel extremely foolish most of the time. When I try to say a Greek word, it doesn't come out right ever. Sometimes I've studied it, I'm like, never mind. We're going to stay right here, God. We're not going there, right? And God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so I want to I show you what you do instead. You're going to take captive the voice of Satan, other people, your, your, yourself. Watch what he says as, as we get ready to wrap this up. He says this first. Take captive. But the first thing he says is we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So if you think of it, you're going to take captive and then you're going to demolish every pretension and argument. I love that word pretension because what it means is a claim or assertion of a claim to something. So you get in a situation, and there's a claim made from, from Satan. There's a claim made from society. There, there's something coming through your head, and you're going, I don't know if this is real. You're going to take it captive, and you're going to make it pressure. You're going to press it, the present, the pretensions. You're going to put pressure on it, and it's surrounded with the truth of God. And so I started thinking about this. How does this look? In my house, every once in a while, it was Mother's Day. I was thinking about how much I love my wife and all these things. And in my house, every once in a while, my wife will be there, and I'll be there, and my boys will be there, and I, I just... I just go over, and you, you know, we're, we're, we're in love 20 years still, and so we fight just like you, and sometimes we have bad moments, but sometimes I just go, man, I love you, and I want to hug her, and I want to hold her, I want to squeeze her, and you know, all the things that husbands try to do. You guys know what I'm saying? And sometimes my kids will go, Ugh! go somewhere else, and here's my reply. My reply is, this is my house. If you don't like it, you leave, but if you're in the room, you're going to have to be around this. You're going to see me squeezing. You're going to see me patting. You're going to see me kissing. You're going to see all that going on. Number one, you need to see it because I'm trying to teach you what it looks like to have a godly marriage. And sex and intimacy is part of it. Can I get an amen, right? <laughs> don't make me get the Bible out. I don't know Greek, but I do know where that's at in the Bible. <laughs> and I'll say, you got it. If, you, 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 if you're going to be here, you're going to see it. And this is what I'm... You can't stop Satan. You're not going to stop people from talking crap about you. You're not going to talk people from lying about you. It's going to be a hard time for you to control your emotions and your thoughts. And so when that happens, they're not going to leave. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to surround those situations with the truth of God. And I'm not talking about happy thoughts. Oh, just have happy thoughts. Or, 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 or I love what people say, positive uh, affirmations. I'm going to speak positive affirmation over myself. No, no. What I'm talking about is biblical truth that is totally dependent on God. You're going to speak that over your life. You're going to take captive and you're going to pressure and, and push down all of the negative talk that comes into your mind because your mind is where everything's won. 
So I started thinking about my, my life and what if, what if for the next, the next week, the next month, every day, I started to renew my mind. What, what does that look like? And I started, I started writing some power thoughts down in my life based on scripture, which by the way is the core. So I started thinking, what if we did this all week? What if every time you got into a fight? What if every time you got into a stressful situation? What if every time you started feeling overwhelmed, unloved, unimportant, not significant? What if every time, instead of allowing Satan and other people to influence you, you began to think and speak truth? And so it would sound something like this. Psalms 139 says, I'm remarkably made. I am remarkably made made. Psalms 8 says, I'm more than a conqueror. Deuteronomy 31 says, I'm strong and courageous. 2 Corinthians says, I'm not who I once was. I am forgiven. Philippians 1 says, I will unashamedly live for God and not man. Psalm 71 says, I will not be led astray. God is always guiding me. Proverbs 3 says, I will not depend on my own understanding. Romans 8 says, God is intentional with my life. All things are working for my good. Deuteronomy 20 says, God is not punishing me. He is fighting on my behalf. Jeremiah 29 says, I have a future filled with hope. 2 Timothy says, fear does not hold me captive. Philippians 4 says, I have peace that surpasses all understanding. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, I can, I can overcome everything with Christ. So let's just imagine it for a second. Go back to that tunnel. Everybody stand up with me all over this house. Stand up with me in Montgomeryville. Just stand up. Come on, I'm not going to make you do anything weird. Well, a little weird maybe, but not weird. And let's just imagine ourselves. Some of you, 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 you need that helmet. You just, some of you, your kids have a lacrosse helmet at home, a batting helmet, something like that. You just need to go put it on. And, and, and what if you would just envision yourself Every day you begin to speak something like that. You take out all the Bible references that are needed because that's truth, and you just say it. I'm remarkably made. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm strong and courageous. I'm not who I once was. I'm forgiven. I will unashamedly live for God, not man. I will not be led astray. God is always guiding me. I'm not going to depend on my own understanding. God's intentional with my life. All things are working for my good. God's not punishing me. He's fighting on my behalf. I got a future filled with hope. Fear does not hold me captive. I have peace that surpasses all understanding, and I can overcome everything with Christ. What if every time that you struggled this week, you just went and you skewed yourself into the bathroom, moms? I know the little, little finger's gonna come up trying to get you through the bathroom, and you just looked in the mirror and you just began to speak that. I am, I'm not who I once was. I'm forgiven. Thank you, God. I will unashamedly live for God. I'm not gonna be led astray, God. And you just began to speak these power truths over your head. You think something will happen? You think your mind will be renewed? You think you'll begin to function differently? You think the same things that Satan throws at you are going to overwhelm you? You're going to laugh them right off. You're going to surround the crap he brings into your life with truth. You're going to make it uncomfortable for him to live in your stratosphere of life. Amen? And so we're going to put these online. Maybe you got your own. Maybe you're way more biblical than me. You're like, that's, that's nothing, fool. And so, and there's, there's hundreds of them. Every time. Every situation, every fight, every argument, some of you are going to go to your mom's house or your dad's house today, and there's going to be tension because it's family. And instead of freaking out about your, at your sibling because they brought roles, you know what I'm talking about? The role person in the family. You slaved all night about roles and Turkey Hill iced tea. You're going to go into the bathroom. You're going to take a deep breath. You're not going to internalize it. You're not going to take offense to it. You're not going to let the enemy control your mind. And you're going to speak power thoughts over your life. You're going to come out. And you're going to have the peace of God that transcends all understanding. You're not going to respond the same way because you're not the same person. You're forgiven. You're filled with grace. You're a child of God adopted into his family. Get to work tomorrow. Go to school tomorrow. Drive tomorrow. Some of you need to tape these to your windshield. Just put them right there. Tape them there. Say it to yourself. Some of you need to put a reminder on your phone. Ding. I need to say this every day. And I'm going to speak the truth. I'm not listening to the voice of Satan. I'm not listening to the voice of others. I'm definitely going to stop listening to myself. And I'm going to start filling my mind with the truth of God's words and his mind and his thoughts. Amen. Let's close our eyes. Let's bow our heads all over this place. And uh, before I dismiss you, I, I just, I don't know why I keep thinking specifically about about the women in this place i know there's guys here and we are just as jacked up as as the ladies and uh some of us need christ some guys and he's here and he loves you and this day's bigger than just you know the calendar of mother's day but i i just I, my heart is just it's 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 hurting for some somebody in this place today 
You're, you're literally, you carry around failure and uh, rejection and a sense of not being good enough. You're not far enough in life as you thought you would be. You haven't hit those milestones you thought you would hit. You failed more times than you'd like to say it. And you just are overwhelmed with life, specifically a female in this place. And all those things you're hearing, they're not true. They're not true. There's a God that loves you. There's a God that's working in your life. There's a God that's working for you. There's a God who has perfect timing. There's a God who has the right doors that he's opening. And there's a God that's closing the wrong doors. And he loves you. He's not disappointed in you. He's not far from you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to know his goodness. He wants you to receive his grace. He wants you to walk in his mercy. You're not perfect. Maybe somebody should say that to themselves right now. I'm not perfect. That's common sense. That's why we needed Jesus. He's perfect. He loves us. He died for us. He gave himself up for us. Now it's through his death, burial, and his sacrifice that we get to have a relationship with him where we rest on his grace and we receive his forgiveness. And when you meet that, man, it changes everything. It changes everything. And he's here. You haven't gone too far. You haven't done too much. You haven't been away too long. He loves you. His love is enduring. I love that word because I've never been a good long distance runner. But endurance is the ability to keep going. So some of you need to realize you've been running and you've been struggling and you've been suffering and you've been overwhelmed. But if you would just stop and turn, he's right there with you. He wants to guide you, direct you, love you, encourage you, strengthen you. He wants you. He wants a relationship with you. So I'm going to pray as we close. I'm not sure who you are, where you're at. And I, I know I talked to the ladies a little bit there, but I know there's guys here that don't know Christ either. Maybe you're confused by what that means. Not are you religious. Religion is so broke. Religion means that you have a set of beliefs that you attain to and you, you do enough that there's a God somewhere that he'll take you back because you did enough. The gospel says you can never do enough so Jesus came and did it all. He died for you. He rose for you. The Bible says that he ascended to heaven for you and he intercedes for you by name, I believe. And you get to rest in that. You get to receive that. It's the gift, the gospel, the gift of salvation. And he's here right now and I can promise you beyond your comprehension and beyond any words that I could speak or convey to you, he loves you. And if you would just open up your life, the Bible says this, that we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. The wages of our sin is death and hell, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For anyone who calls on him shall be saved. For if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, and he would come into your life right where you're at. He'll meet you and he'll change you. So I want to pray all over this place. In Montgomeryville, I want to pray. And I'm going to ask you a simple question. You need Jesus? A simple song we sang is so powerful. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but Jesus. He's always, only, ever going to be the answer to our lives. All over this place, I need to say yes to Jesus Christ right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to do one thing for me. If I'm speaking to you, you need Jesus. You're carrying around failure, condemnation. You're hearing the wrong voices in your life. You're overwhelmed with your past and who you are. But you know today I need to become a brand new person in Jesus' name. 
I need hope, love, and grace. If that's you all over this place and in Montgomeryville, and you would say that to me, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Would you do one thing for me? A little bit of courage. One big step of faith. If you would say, that's me. Nobody looking around all over these houses. That's me. Would you just shoot your hand straight towards heaven and say, hey, you're speaking to me. I see a hand right here. Is there anybody else? I see another hand right here. Another hand. I need Jesus to come into my life right now. I swear I'm at. If you're in Montgomeryville, would you just keep your hand held high for a second? They're going to let me know. And let's just begin to pray all over our houses. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done here today. We thank you that that church is such a great place to come to. Because we can come with all of our baggage, all of our sorrow, all of our junk. And your presence offers an exit ramp. It's not a place where we come and we feel worse and more heavy and more overwhelmed. But we come into your presence. And Lord, there's freedom, the Bible says. There's hope. There's joy, unspeakable joy. Father, somehow in your presence, there's a peace that surpasses all understanding. And we know you're here. The Bible promises that where two or more are gathered in your name, that Jesus will show up. So your presence is here. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to move in this place. For those that raised their hand, you saw them, Lord. And would you just begin to minister and move in their life? It's beyond just a prayer. The prayer is our mission to you that we need a relationship with you. But your presence comes into our lives in a powerful way. And you begin to change us from the inside out. You heal our hearts. You begin to change our minds. You fill us with love and hope and joy. And we leave this place a brand new person. Lord, we're grateful for that. I pray one more time that every mother in this room, every woman that's represented would just would just leave this place feeling so full of honor, that they would understand the worth that they have in you, the value that they bring to this world. Lord, they would continue to see their investment is important in the lives of their family. Lord, everything that they do, even the smallest things that seem unnoticed, that they have impact in the kingdom and for eternity. And we're grateful for that. As kids, help us to to pay honor to our our mothers today. Lord, even those in this room that that the relationship with their mom is strained, Lord, that, that those that maybe they don't even know Christ, that you would just help us to extend the same grace that we received here. Let's let us just remember that when we leave this place. Without your grace, we wouldn't be here. Without your grace, we wouldn't be able to walk into this room. Without your grace, we wouldn't be able to lift your hands. But the grace and the mercy of God changed us. So, Lord, we're going to extend that to to our loved ones and those we come into contact with this week. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all that you've done here today. In Jesus' name we pray. One more time. Would you shout amen? Let's clap together one more time. Hey, thanks for joining us for Church Online. If it's your first time joining us, we hope that you learned something new and began to understand God's love and plan for your life. If you have any questions about what you heard today, what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus, or how to join us in person, you can check out the link in our bio and fill out an online VIP card. Our team would love to reach out to help answer any of your questions. Have a great rest of your week. We'll see you Sunday.